Hi everybody, and I'm Dr. Adam Tiemann, back with you with Lecture 8 of the Digital VLSI Design Course at bar Ilan University. And in this lecture, we'll discuss the clock tree synthesis. So just as a reminder where we are in the design flow. Well, this is our whole design flow over here from design and planning all the way down to sign off, tape out, and finally physical validation. And um, we've synthesized our design technology into the, uh, our design into a technology mapped gate level net list. Then we designed a floor plan for physical implementation and provide a location um, for each and every gate through placement. And here's a, a zoom in on our physical implementation, which will, will be um, actually with, with us pretty much to the end of the course. Okay, and during all stages, we analyze the timing constraints and optimize the design according to these constraints. However, until now, we have assumed an ideal clock. In, um, this, uh, in this lecture, we're going to actually discuss, discuss what a real clock signal is. So we have all the sequential elements placed. We have our flip-flops around the design, and maybe we may have some hard macros that also have some sort of a clock input. And now we have to provide an actual clock signal to all of them. So what's the trivial approach to doing this? Why don't we just route the clock net just like any other net, just bring it um, to each and every flip-flop in just a general way like we treat every other signal. Well, the, the, the answer is a, a, a multi-dimensional kind of an answer, and it has implications on timing, power, area, signal, integrity, and other things, and we'll go into those in the next um, slides. So we'll now discuss the implications of clocking, timing, out, power, area, and signal integrity. So we'll start with timing. We just have to start by remembering our famous timing constraints that are an integral part of this course. And we have the max delay constraint, which takes our launch clock here that comes at the first flip-flop, and it goes through our TCQ plus our T-logic, and we have to arrive at the arrival at the end point. Uh, our arrival time has to be shorter than the, the T, the um, uh, clock frequency, plus whatever type of skew we have here on our clock and it has to be at least set up time before the clock arrives. So that was our, our um, uh, kind of our, um, our first max delay equation. Our second equation was the min delay equation, where we said that when we launch our clock, we have to make sure that um, we don't skip a clock cycle by um, having the TCQ plus T logic be at least longer than without the big T at the same clock cycle, longer than um, the delta skew uh, plus the hold time constraint of our flip-flop. And th that was our min delay constraint. So when we said that, we discussed uh, at least one parameter, which is uh, the skew. And the skew is defined as the difference in the clock arrival time at two different registers. So we have register A here and register B, and the clock is coming from the same place. One of these pads over here is driving the clock, and there will be some sort of a margin in between it. So if we kind of like look at this type of a, uh, of a um, uh, waveform, we have um, the signal that arrives at clock A and the signal that arrives at clock B uh, at uh, the clocking signal at uh, note at flip-flop A and the clocking signal at flip-flop B and we see that the um, clock arrives to flip-flop B earlier than it does at flip-flop A. That's what we call negative skew. So any type of a difference um, that is a, a, a that is what um, uh, s th that's what our uh, skew is, and in this case, for example, we have this type of a compressed timing path because the the, the clock arrived later at the launch clock, and it ate away from our timing. Jitter, on the other hand, which we also briefly discussed, is a different kind of phenomenon. It's uh, the difference in, in clock period between different cycles. So we're now discussing the same flip-flop over here. And so, for example, if a flip-flop has a path that has a feedback to itself, then the skew is obviously zero because we're getting to the same point. But still, we do have a difference in uh, the phase of the clock when it arrives. So um, the, the, the jitter can arrive from all kinds of things. It is a difference in clock period over time because the actual clock edge doesn't arrive exactly at the same um, point that it did uh, the, the clock period before. Slew, which uh, is something we haven't exactly 
um, defined up till now, or we may call it transition time, is the, the T rise, the rise time, or the fall time of the clock signal. So slew is an important thing, or transition time. And insertion delay is the actual time, the delay from the clock source until the register. So if our clock source was over here, the actual time it took to propagate the clock to each point, that's the insertion delay to that point. Uh, often we'll say insertion delay of the whole clock network as the average insertion delay to all the clock points. How do clock skew and jitter arise? Well, they can arise, first of all, from our clock generation, such as our PLL, um, which we'll discuss towards the end of the class today. Second of all, from the distribution network. So usually our PLL will be driving some sort of a central clock driver, and it will get into a distribution network, which will include buffers. And skew may arise because, for example, the number of buffers to each endpoint will be different. So the number of buffers, but also the variation in the buffer. So even if we have two buffers to this point, two buffers to this point, two buffers to this point, we'll still have variations, for example, in, um, in, in uh, manufacturing between the different buffers, and so they'll have different speeds. We have wire length variation, so even though we have two buffers to each point here, uh, possibly the wire length to each point will be different. The RC will probably be different, and that is another type of uh, variation. We also may have coupling, different coupling to other wires that are next to it, which cause some sort of a, an extra RC delay, and uh, different loads. So maybe the uh, load here is different for each wire, again, causing a different RC delay. Okay, and we have, of course, environmental variation. So we have, um, uh, when we discuss usually PVT, power, uh, which is process temperature and voltage, um, so the temperature can vary. So it may be different temperature over here and over here, which causes a, a difference in the speed of these buffers. And the power supply, there may be more IR drop to one point than another, which again will cause some sort of a variation. Here's a, a very old... Um, little graph by Intel, but this this is very system dependent and so forth. Um, but it's a 1998 uh, graph in an 0.25 micron process. And here is how the, they mapped out the, um, the, the uh, um, sources of skew and jitter. And here they showed it was mainly from due to device mismatch. But um, this is kind of a typical kind of, kind of thing that you could find, but it really does depend on your chip and so forth. So if we take that back and we go back to our um, to our equations, so we have a launch clock over here, and I'll draw um, a positive skew capture clock. So that means that our uh, capture clock arrives later than the launch clock, and that brings us positive skew. So the, the clock arrives here later than here, and the difference between these two points is positive skew. But it also could be the opposite, where um, the capture clock arrives uh, earlier than the launch clock, and in this type, uh, in, in this type of situation, we call it negative skew. Okay, and so when we look at our timing paths. So first of all, we have to take jitter, and jitter is a random phenomena. So let's say we take a 5% jitter on the clock, and so it can be 5% later or 5% earlier. So I'm drawing around each of these clock edges, there is jitter in both directions. Um, now, when we want to go and uh, rethink what our max delay and our min delay are, so we look at our max delay, and the, the, the blue line is our max delay in the case of positive skew. And what we see is that due to the positive skew, we got an increased um, delay. We see that t plus delta skew, that means that this side of the equation will be larger. And so um, I, I drew it blue because positive skew actually helps us. On the other hand, when we have negative skew, this t plus delta skew, when delta is negative, it makes our, our, our clock cycle shorter, and it makes it harder to meet our timing conditions. In any case, what we see here is that in the worst case, uh, for, for um, for for both our positive and negative skew um, cases, the launch clock could have come out later because of uh, it could have risen over here, and it could have been captured earlier. So what we do is that's uh, one delta jitter and two delta jitter. So we actually remove two delta jitter from our um, from our launch path. So we come out with an equation that's t plus delta skew minus two delta jitter is bigger than our TCQ plus uh, T logic plus T setup plus extra margins that we'll discuss towards the end of the course, okay? And um, what that means is that jitter is always going to hurt us. It's going to hurt us really badly because we have to take the worst case since it's a random, um, it's a random phenomenon that comes uh, happens around our clock edge. Um, for the skew, 
positive skew will help our setup constraint and it will impede uh, uh, our negative skew will impede our setup constraint looking at uh, min delay now we see that obviously I guess the opposite happens that um, when we have a uh, positive skew uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a worst case so we want um, now this side to be as small as possible right and uh, when we have positive skew this delta skew is gonna be larger which is gonna make it harder to meet this min delay constraint on the other hand when this is negative it's gonna be easier so negative skew is gonna be easier with um, uh, on hold whereas positive skew is gonna be harder and that makes sense if if uh, positive skew helped us for the max delay then it hurts us for the min delay and vice versa um, but one thing that we have to point out is that jitter again is, is a phenomenon that happens from clock cycle to clock cycle so I basically um, like to not take into account jitter on hold and the reason is we're talking about the same clock cycle so if uh, if I'm looking at um, uh, the jitter that mainly maybe arises from the clock generation and clock distribution and the the uh, trunk of the clock distribution network that is something that should that will not uh, change between clock cycles yes um, there is some jitter that arises due to temporal um, uh, changes in uh, across in a spatial fashion so there may be a bit different in jitter from one clock cycle to another in the flip-flops but it's much smaller and for sure I would not say to take the minus two jitter which is often shown in different textbooks okay so that was our implication on timing let's go over the implications on power um, for that we have to remember our equations for uh, calculating dynamic power and dynamic power is basically the freak the clock frequency times the um, capacitance that is toggling times the voltage supply squared but what is this effective capacitance so we have to break it down and one way to break it down is saying some sort of activity factor times the total capacitance of the design and the activity factor is how much of the design is actually toggling in, uh, in an average clock cycle and we can further divide the activity factor into two things the activity factor of the clock network and the activity factor of all the other um, uh, nets and sometimes activity factor is taken for systems that may be 20 percent maybe even less 10 percent and it could be much further especially if we apply clock gating or so forth but the activity uh, factor of the clock cycle is basically a hundred percent on all clocks that are not gated so um, since this is a hundred percent anything that is the in the C clock this this whole uh, factor is going to be large in the in the equation so since the activity factor of the clock network is high we understand that every type of uh, capacitance that we have on the clock network is wasting quite a bit of power when we look at the clock capacitance what does it consist of well first of all we have the clock generation so we have the PLL or the clock dividers or whatever is generating our clock and they're obviously um, consuming power then we have the clock elements so we have the different buff buffers we may have clock muxes or clock gates they're also consuming some power and we have the wires the large RC's of the clock wires and they're consuming a lot of power and then we have the load of the sequential elements so the clock pins on the flip-flops are also um, part of the capacitance of the this part of this C clock over here and just to, to, to summarize that clock networks are huge and therefore the clock is responsible for a large percentage of the total ship power so um, actually this is another type of a chart they sometimes show these in pie charts of how much uh, of the power uh, is consumed by different parts of a system and this is just a, a general type of example it is I mean it's a, an example of a certain system that you could have 40 percent of the power be from the clocks but there can be other systems where it can be even 80 percent and some other systems it could be as low as maybe 10 percent so just, this is just kind of uh, something to, to look at and get an idea of what could be. Okay, so that was uh, power. How about signal integrity? And we haven't mentioned signal integrity too much up till now in the course, but, uh, but um, it's an obvious requirement for the clock network. So noise on the clock uh, network can cause a bunch of things first of all in the worst case it causes additional clock edges additional clock edges that's blue screen of death if we have an additional clock edge we for sure have some sort of a setup or hold violation we have problems and uh, our system will stop working obviously um, but even if we have lower uh, coupling capacitance 
we can still slow down or speed up the clock propagation depending on um, if the uh, clock signal is now rising and the signal and the, the signal it's affecting is rising or the clock signal is rising and the signal it's affecting is uh, falling and vice versa of course so if it's in the same direction it will speed up and if it's in the opposite direction it'll slow down and that again will have implications on our timing uh, equations that we saw before. Another thing that we have to look at is that irregular clock edges can impede register uh, operation. So if you remember we had our in our lib files um, we had these lookup tables that took into account uh, you know uh, C load and here they had T rise or T fall of uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the of the of the input and for a um, for uh, flip flop we have TCQ over here which we want to figure out so uh, the club and for T setup and T hold as well so the C over here is the T rise and T fall of the clock network and if we're too long then we'll be somewhere over here, maybe even out of the table. And if we're too fast, we'll be somewhere over here, maybe even out of the table. And then our models won't be correct in any way. It'll make our hold or um, or, or setup or TCQs uh, be less than uh, less than optimal. Okay. So when we look at slow clock transitions, so we have a high slew rate. Okay. So then it's going to also make our clock very susceptible to noise. So if you have a, um, a slow slew rate, in other words, if your uh, signal is going really slowly, that means that the driver of the signal is small, driving a big, big uh, capacitance or a big RC. And uh, that means that our, we have a weak driver and that's not good because then any type of coupling to that signal can easily um, really affect it. So that's bad. And uh, as I said before, we're going to have poor in the TCQ, T setup, and T hold due to the uh, uh, the um, the dependence of our of our parameters here on on the slew rate of our input. If our transitions are too fast, well, that means we had a really big um, driver over here, so we had some over design, and this driver is going to cost us in terms of power, area, etc. And the other thing is, if we have another signal over here, and the clock is an aggressor to it, this type of a, a of a very sharp transition is going to have a large effect on this guy, and maybe cause it to have some noise. So, um, as a kind of a, a of a summary, what we should do is um, we should have some sort of a, um, a best practice to keep T rise and T fall between 10 to 20 percent of the clock period. So it should be like 100 to 200 picoseconds at a one gigahertz clock. Um, so uh, and just another point over here, we saw in our standard cell libraries that our our clock elements their um, balance so T uh, TPLH uh, kind of equals TPHL. Um, and uh, T rise kind of equals T fall at the output and and that uh, actually helps us keep the skew lower than if it were different and we cause larger um, differences. Okay, so um, our uh, that was a uh, signal integrity and our final implication is on area and uh, the clock network we already discussed it consists of clock generators, clock elements, and clock wires, and all of these consume area. So clock genera generators such as PLLs can be very large. They're often kind of an analog, hard, uh, hard macro, and they can be really large depending on how much jitter you want and what, what kind of functionality you want from it. Um, clock buffers are distributed all over the place, so they take up a lot of area. And clock wires uh, consume a lot of routing resources, which may make us have to uh, um, have lower utilization in our placement. And just as an example here, in the Intel Itanium, 4% of M4 and M5 was used for clock routing. Okay. Routing resources are often the most vital part of this. Um, the routing requires to have low RC for transition and power um, implications, and um, that's why we're going to try to use high and wide metals okay, for, for the clocks. Um, and we just have to remember that we have to connect every single clock element, every flip-flop, every uh, macro clock input. And th that means that this clock network is going to have to be distributed all over the chip. We can see here some sort of an example here from uh, Bonn, uh, where they have the clock network and all the, the, the clock sinks that are all over the chip. And if we have a higher metal um, driving if we use their high wide metals, we have to take this via stack that goes all the way down until it reaches the uh, the the sink or the buffer that it's uh, that is driving.